Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back to the Cartoon Hotspot. This video has been widely requested, so today I'll be ranking the seasons of She-Ra and the Princesses of Power. I guess it's safe to say that everyone is missing She-Ra since it ended back in May, so I thought why not put us out of our misery and just do this video. By the way, has the trend for the Shira movie suddenly died or is that still going on? As I said, I'll be ranking the seasons based on three things, structure, plot and character arcs, as well as how well each season finished off. Similar to my last video where I ranked the seasons of Winx Club, be sure to check it out if you haven't already. Before we get into this video, make sure to subscribe to my channel, follow me on Instagram and Twitter and turn on that bell button to receive a notification whenever I post. Without further ado, Let's get into this video. In fifth position, I've decided to put season two. If I'm being honest with you, I don't think any season of Shira is bad, but someone's got to fill up bottom place. Generally speaking, the only reason season two is below every other season is because you don't really need to watch all the episodes to understand the next season. It's more so a filler season. So this season directly follows from the first season when we see the members of the Princess Alliance working together to try and restore the Whispering Woods from the damage inflicted by the Horde in the Battle of Bright Moon. Bo realises that Entrapta is alive and is working for the Horde, so devises a plan to rescue her only to find that she willingly wants to stay in the Horde. Meanwhile, Adora and Swiftwind have to learn to magically bond in order to repair the damage Mara caused. Shadow Weaver is still in prison but escapes putting Capture in trouble and we learn more about the constellation of Serenia and how it ties to Mara. Like I said, I don't think any season of Shira is bad, therefore all of its seasons have a great structure even if the plot is relatively weaker than the rest. In this case, it'd be season two. In terms of plot, compared to the other seasons, season two falls down on plot simply because it's a filler season. Most of the episodes are more so purely for enjoyment, like roll with it and white out. Whilst they were funny to watch, it just didn't add anything to the plot, which is why I have to knock it down. Also, this may be my personal opinion, but whenever I want to rewatch she -Ra, season two is my last resort. In terms of character development, likewise, this season falls down. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. Season 2 only prepares us for the character arcs we're going to get in the next seasons. I would say the only person who had a predominantly strong arc this season is Bo. He learns to embrace his identity as a fighter for the rebellion and to not be scared to show his dad who he truly is, thus telling them he does not want to be a historian. Sitting comfortably in fourth position is season one. Similar to Winx Club, the first season of She-Ra is very strong. So in this season, we're introduced to Horde soldier Adora, who sneaks out after a training session and finds a sword in the Whispering Woods. She discovers that she is a legendary hero, She-Ra, set to return in the hour of Etheria's greatest need. She meets best friends Bo and Princess Glimmer, who at first had a rocky encounter with Adora, who show her what the Horde are really doing to Etheria leading Odora to make a bold decision and defect from the Horde to join the rebellion, causing a rift between her and her childhood best friend, Catra. Honestly speaking, I can't knock this season down for its structure. Every episode flowed nicely and there's no episode I deem boring or irrelevant. The first half of the season focuses on the best friend squad reassembling the Princess Alliance, as well as Catra being sent by Shadow Weaver to bring Adora back. Honestly, Shadow Weaver's obsession with Adora was seriously unhealthy and creepy. The second half of the season focuses on Catra and Adora questioning their positions and where they are. Arguably the best and the most interesting part of this season is the conflict between Catra and Adora and just how deep its roots stem from. Adora's newfound allegiance to the rebellion pits her against Catra, her former best friend, whose feelings of betrayal and abandonment twist her personal ambitions and lead her to become Adora's mortal enemy. We also learn why Catra behaves the way she does in an emotional episode and my personal favourite of the entire season, Promise. In this episode, we also get taken back to Catra and Adora's childhood and just how toxic the environment they grew up in was. We learned that Shadow Weaver had always had it in for Catra, emotionally and in some cases physically abusing her, but massively favouring Adora, thus driving a wedge between the girls, causing Catra to develop feelings of hatred and jealousy towards Adora. In the end, those painful memories drives Catra into making a somewhat dangerous decision. Catra! Catra, no! Adora, you must let go. Other episodes I personally loved were Raz, In the Shadow of Mystical, and of course the fan favourite, Princess Prom. I can appreciate the fact that season one is the first season of She-Ra and so lacks in character development, but what I will praise it for is the character arcs. The arcs in the season prepares us for the character development we will see in later seasons, in particular Glimmer, Catra and Adora. Cruising in third position is season three, so we got season three in third place. 
This season for me gave me a turbulence of emotions. Despite it being only six episodes, straight away at the start of the season, we're thrown into a major storyline surrounding Adora's origins. Shadow Weaver, after having escaped the Horde prison, arrives in Brightmoon and tells the rebellion of Hordak's plan to build an interdimensional portal which will allow him to contact his creator, the Warlord, Horde Prime. She also explains to Adora that she is not of Etheria, causing Adora to storm out and confront Light Hope, who also confirms that Adora is the first one. The best friend squad embark on a mission to the Crimson Waste to learn more of the constellation of Serenia in hope to find out more about Mara since Mara and Adora are from the same place. However, the mission is called to a halt after Capture activates the portal, threatening to tear the planet apart. One drawback I have for this season, and it could very well be my personal opinion, but I would have loved a bit more episodes in the Crimson Waste before the best friend squad get taken back to Brightmoon. I don't know, I felt like the whole storyline of Adora wanting to find out where she's from was overlooked and completely forgotten about, since it was never really brought up again. Even something along the lines of, I don't know, even though you weren't able to find out more about your past, I want you to know that you are family. Perhaps Glimmer, Bo, or even Angela could have said something, but it just felt like that was forgotten about. Where this season does great on is its plot. The best friend squad in the Crimson Waste was interesting to see, given that the Crimson Waste is supposed to be some death land or whatever. I particularly loved episode Huntara and especially the fight scene. Huntara being a former Horde soldier who defected similar to Adora was a twist I never saw coming, but I do wish this was explored further in some way. Just a suggestion, but I kind of wish Huntara went back to the Horde in the episode where they save Adora and then she probably meets someone she knew a long time ago and explains to them why she had to leave. This would have made the episode all the more interesting but hey it still was a good episode and of course the whole plot surrounding the alternate reality was oh my gosh what hit me hard was the fact that both Capture and Adora's ideal world even when Adora was force captain Capture didn't even want power all she cared about was the fact her best friend was there with her and that's probably all she's ever wanted Arguably the point where Catradora stands probably lost hope for Catradora in becoming canon in any way was when Adora finally saw how toxic Catra was and this was executed in such an epic punch. Oh my gosh that punch was so powerful. Seriously why does nobody talk about this? And finally oh my gosh the finale of season 3 was... <sighs> okay I'm gonna take a moment to cry but I'll be back. I'm just gonna take a moment to cry. <laughs> Angela sacrificing herself was unexpected and I mean unexpected. I think what's super emotional about this was the fact that the last time she saw Glimmer, the actual reality not the alternate reality, wasn't the best. I mean their last conversation ended in an intense argument with Glimmer telling her mother she's too paralysed in fear. Honestly, the biggest character arcs in this season were Catra and Angela. This season, we really see just how far Catra is willing to go just to prove a point, and it sets the stage for her arc in the next season. We also see just how damaged she is in general after she learns that Shadow Weaver left the Horde to join Adora, leading to Catra's hunger to win, as she puts it, becoming more and more dangerous to the point she doesn't even care if the world is destroyed. Angela finally saying she chooses to be brave is just as great. So yeah, season 3, you've outdone yourself. In second place is season 4. Originally, I had put this season below season 3, but speaking objectively, it is the strongest season. A lot of things were happening in the season and it was overwhelming, but in a good way, that kept us on our toes and on the edge of our seats. The season follows directly from the events of season 3, as Glimmer is now the Queen of Brightmoon and struggling to come to terms with her mother's disappearance. This season takes place in many different places such as Bright Moon, the Fright Zone, the Crimson Wave, Beast Island and the Crystal Castle, all the more making it interesting. In terms of structure, this season does really well, and I mean really well. Nothing felt rushed and all the episodes were cohesive with one another. Apart from the episode Protocol, which I find boring, every episode was pretty solid. The first five episodes focus on Glimmer establishing what kind of queen she wants to be, and the next few episodes focus on the tension between Glimmer and Adora, whilst the last few episodes is heavily centred around the heart of Etheria, all whilst linking together nicely. Friction arises between Adora and Glimmer as the Rebellion are in the worst shape ever, after Flutterina, actually Double Trouble, was revealed to be a Horde spy causing Mimista's kingdom to fall. Adora also learns of the Heart of Etheria project that was supposed to be capable of good, but really was a super weapon to destroy other planets, 
she discovers that Mara turned against the first ones and Light Hope by transporting Etheria into the empty dimension of the Spondos, sacrificing herself in the process. Glimmer, desperate as ever, wants to use the weapon to turn the tide of the war in the Rebellion's favour, further straining her friendship with Adora and even Bo, who realise the only person who can deactivate the weapon is Entraptor. Bo and Adora leave for Beast Island along with Swift Wind, discovering that King Micah is still alive. They find Entraptor, but unfortunately they are too late by the time they return as the last princess, Scorpia, has reconnected with her runestone, thus activating the weapon. I particularly loved how we got an episode dedicated to Mara, as since season one, her name has always kind of echoed in our ears and finally everything makes sense. Scorpio also leaving the hall was interesting because you'd think Scorpio would always be there for Catra but it showed just how toxic Catra became and honestly I did expect this I just didn't know when to expect it. Okay this is where the strong character arcs start coming together in particular Glimmer, Adora and Catra. Regarding Glimmer I think it was necessary for her to be portrayed in the way she was for season 4 I'm sorry, are people forgetting she suddenly lost her mother and was expected to rule a kingdom at a young age? Of course she was going to act the way she did and it really just set the stage for her development she would have in the next season. Another thing I really liked about this season was Catra's arc as well, which is the beginning of her development. In the episode Fractures, we actually see her have a mental breakdown and this was great writing. It showed just how mentally unstable she was. She even admits that all this time she thought winning is what she truly desired but quickly realises that what she really needs and cherishes is love and friendship and this is triggered after Scorpio leaves the Horde. At this point, Catra is alone. Particularly one of my favourite part of the season was the introduction of the non-binary character Double Trouble who was a driving force in Catra's arc. In this season as well, Adora is so focused on proving Glimmer wrong that she kind of gets lost in her own self-doubt. She realises the only person stopping her from being strong is herself and this was executed in a brilliant way in the episode Beast Island. Honestly, that moment is so underrated. By the end of the season, to stop the portal from activating, Adora shatters the key to the heart of Etheria, her sword, thus losing her Shira powers. I think this was pivotal for her arc. Often the things we think we need the most is what holds us back, and it's what deters us from reaching our full potential. Adora needed to break her sword, and I'll let Raz have the honour of explaining this. <laughs> Shira is not a sword. Shira is you. Ah, oh, yes. Wise words from Madam Raz. Overall, the season is very strong in all three categories, but of course, reigning as the best season of Shira is season five. Season five was jam packed with action, all whilst being highly emotive. Back in season four, Etheria was pulled out of the dimension of Despondos, allowing Horde Prime to capture both Glimmer and Catra, all whilst Adora shattered her sword, losing her Shira powers. At the beginning of Season 5, the remaining Rebellion fighters rallied around Adora, now armed only with a staff to protect Etheria. However, by now, Horde Prime now wants to use the Heart of Etheria, aware that Shira is the key to activating it. In the end, it's Adora and Catra's love for each other that enables Shira to destroy the weapon and save the universe from Horde Prime's tyrannical reign. In terms of structure, this season does very well in the space of 13 episodes. Each episode linked nicely with one another and what I really love about season 5 is how it tied up loose ends and plot holes that we needed answers to. Season 5 plot is by far the best plot of the entire series. There's so many things I can go on and on and on about. From the episode corridors onwards, the plot started coming together. We see memories of a young Catra and Adora during their time on the Shadow Weaver's care in the Horde. The memory of Adora telling Catra she'll always be her friend is the spark of the redemptive moment we've been long awaiting. Catra attacks Hordak and frees Glimmer. Adora, Bo and Entraptor en route to the flagship while in Myra's spacecraft are able to intercept Glimmer in space thanks to Catra's help. To punish her, Horde Prime mind controls her through a chip embedded in her neck. A pivotal episode Save the Cat sees Adora surrendering herself to Horde Prime while Entraptor, Bo and Glimmer try to locate Catra. When Prime critically injures Catra, Adora manages to summon the full transformative power of Shira, including a reforged sword and a new outfit. Adora and Catra attempt to make amends and patch up their friendship. The best friend squad realise that Prime's weakness is magic. 
Back on Etheria, after Bo and Glimmer learned that Mara had help in rebellion against the superiors, the first ones, the squad, along with Shadow Weaver and Castor Fella, embark on a mission to Mystical in hope of finding the Felsafe. Though Adora transformed to Shira after bonding with the Felsafe, Catra is tired of Adora always throwing herself on the sword for others. She decides to leave with Milog despite Adora's protest. At the heart, Adora experiences intimate visions of herself alongside Catra, unbeknownst to her that her feline lover also admitted to being in love with Adora. Catra returns to save Adora, who by now has lost her Shira powers due to Cold Prime's virus. Bo and Glimmer confess their love for one another. Shadow Weaver dies. Adora, at the point of death, has one last final vision of her future self with her best friends, whilst Catra confesses her love for Adora, allowing Adora to once again transform into Shira and liberate Etheria from Horde Prime's reign. For me, the character arc slash development of this season were written so well. Glimmer and Catra are by far the best. Glimmer learns to not be selfish and that apology should be heartfelt rather than said for the sake of solely being forgiven. She also has a massive growth in this season after freeing her father from Horde Prime's control. She finds that her strength come from her friends and family who have taught her valuable life lessons. Catra learns to be more open to her emotions rather than suppress them, even going as far to challenge Adora on what she actually wants. She helps Adora realise that she doesn't always need to be the one to sacrifice herself. And her final heroic moment in this season was just asking Adora to stay. And finally, Adora. Throughout the series, Adora has never really understood how her powers work, or why they work. But in season 5, she realises that her love for her friends is her greatest strength, the driving force behind Shiva. She also learns that whilst being the noble self-sacrificing hero is good, it can also be very destructive. In a vision of Mara asking her what she truly wants, really I think it's Adora's projection of her deepest thoughts, Adora discovers that her friends don't want her to always sacrifice herself. Usually the line, at what cost, is said when many lives are at stake. But in this instant, it was only one life that was at stake, Adora's life. What she truly yearns is happiness and this message was told in such a beautiful finale. So that's it from me, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, leave a like and be sure to subscribe to my channel for more like this. If you have any thoughts, comment them down below and let's have a discussion. Bye!